these niggas. Fuck you doing over here with these niggas, bro. That's my coach. Fuck is you doing over here with these niggas, bro? God damn. I didn't know you were listening. I know you were listening. What you was popping? You good? I'm fucking great, bro. I gotta get a picture real quick. That'll be an intelligent thing to do. Here you go with your shit. Anything else would be a super. You coming to my back? When you coming to my boxing gym, man? Whenever you listen, whenever you ready, come coach some of these guys up. Listen, I got you. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Whenever you're ready. Pretty on point, but physics got his car towed today. Unfortunately, physics isn't here right now. He should be here soon. The cameraman. Oh, you don't have? You're still waiting on a cameraman? No, nah, we, all the cameras are here. The We're ready to go. Get the camera. Yeah, it's rock and roll now. I'm over. I mean, if you, hey, <laughs> you know, weed. you ain't got to get ready if you stay ready. You know that. You're part of show business. You're a showman. I never got out of shit. Never let it happen. Not at any point in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Not at any point in my life. All right. Yo, I might have. I might have had a few beers too many and ate some pizza. Uh, you know, the night of or the day of a, a show, my 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 my, my belly might have been poking. But make no mistake about it, those carbs, you know, were quickly used in that ring that night. And by the end of that match, the next day, I was ready. And I usually timed up my meals with TV. Mm. So I went out there, bitch, you know, highly caffeinated. and uh, Highly caffeinated. That was, that very was. dehydrated. <laughs> because when you were wearing the suspenders and the big outfits and you were wrestling with Big Cass in a tag team match and you were Enzo, you were afforded the opportunity to pretty much have a really good time outside of the ring. Because <laughs> you didn't do much when you were in it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, he just came started cutting <coughs> promos on ladies and gentlemen. I just had to cut a promo. Uh, this is the realest <laughs> one in the room. How you doing? Here you go. Check out the music. Chop, yeah. Follow hey. me at real one. Hey, hey, hey wait a second. Uh, no, no, always no, let him go. Go. Wait examine, a second. Examine the game. Examine God the game. damn it. Wait a second, Eric. Give me a fucking moment. You I love that you call me Eric. There's very few people that call me Eric. We're friends in real life. <laughs> I like that. Look, I right, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> boys and girls. If you've been smoking rock or under a rock, you're now tuned into the Personal Party Podcast. Thank you. Cheer! <laughs> Where's the hype man? Right here. I fucking right hate, here, motherfucker. I, when I hate when I say I hate that ad lib, I, I, I usually mute him because I oh, hate that ad lib so fast. No, fuck. <laughs> Never, let's do his mic. <laughs> Yo, today I got my Where'd motherfucking... you get over? <laughs> today I got my motherfucking brother in the building. You know what I mean? He, he, you could have been up here a long He strikes time me as a guy that don't give a fuck. I'm I'll sorry. I'll tell you what. Here's a guy that doesn't give a fuck. He strikes me as that. Into all he of, strikes me I'm as gonna, that. Oh, I'm going to get into rip. all of that. I have my motherfucking brother, somebody that, um, that I, I speak to all the time. A uh, avid lover of fucking marijuana, music, and style. You know what I mean? I'm fucking sure. Some somebody, somebody. You know what I mean? We we go shopping. You know what I mean? Shorts. Got, How about the shoes? Come yeah, on, yeah, nah, come yeah, on. You no, talking about the guys. whole get up? Yo, was you with the hat? Nah, that, that's that's nah, a good no that's bullshit. a good Air Max. Yo, but hold on. Have though. you ever seen this? Because I'm a nah, nobody. I didn't, I didn't see those nineties. I'm gonna tell y'all these are gonna fly off the shelves. If there's any people with style and grace, that that, that they don't look it. Don't sleep. This is from Cole's women's section. And these are a women's size 12 and a half. So, a bitch so a I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I had to buy it up. But, guys, you know, $95, all right? Look, you can I have so my money. own Jordans, but I don't walk by fly shit without buying it. I didn't even get to finish giving you your... He fly. giving it. Let him talk, I'm trying man. to give you your introduction. Fuck. Fucking intro. Can I give you your introduction before before you fucking get into your shit? I've had title fights in Madison Square Garden. Oh, fuck your shit. Fuck your shit. I need no Madison. Fuck your shit. I need no introduction. Fuck your shit. Oh, my God, man. What in the whole fuck? Nah, I missed the air horns because you, you know what I mean? You're doing my motherfucking job, Enzo. All right. 
Jesus Christ. Well, me and you, you know, let's go. We, look, I got the realest one in the room right now. I've never my seen nobody do that. My motherfucking brother. Oh, no, this I've never seen we, this No, because we. this is what we do. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do. This is what we do. So I got my motherfucking brother, you know what I mean? Somebody that I've watched in Madison Square Garden. I've watched on my television screen the only cruiserweight champion to never lose the cruiserweight title. He mm. left on top. How you doing? How you doing? He yeah. cut promos. His first match in the in the in the uh in the on the main roster was with John Cena. Mm. Next to him. Well, I, I have, it was my first match, but first pay per view match. First yeah. pay per view match. Yeah, I guess the first one doesn't count because I got knocked out cold. I know how to make a fucking splash. I, you know what I mean? The I, motherfucking real one. Hey, hey, me fucking. How the fuck did you get knocked out? What happened? I hit my head on a rope working with some fucking jabroni. <laughs> <laughs> End of story. Uh, yeah. Look it up. <laughs> but, Look uh, it up. But did the whole ESPN correspondence, you know. We got the best concussion protocol in place here in the world. It's a business, and I understand how it goes. Mm. So, yes. Uh, you know, anytime you get in a ring and you get, you know, you're out there taking risks and you get knocked out, you signed up for that shit. It's pro wrestling. Accidents happen. And, you know, sometimes guys go out there with bandettas and you don't know about it. And sometimes other times, uh, you know, you just literally fall wrong. And it could be just hitting the ropes. You know, like Dynamite Kid is one of my favorite wrestlers growing up. I know Smoke's a big wrestling fan, so he knows who he is. Mm-hmm. Dynamite Kid, you know, recently became famous for being a dickhead on goddamn uh, Vice Lance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> fucking documentary yeah, yeah, series, yeah. Dark, Dark Side, Side of the Side, Ring. Yeah. Uh, no plug intended. Sorry, I did just, uh, you know, that justice. But um, Dynamite just hit the ropes wrong, and somebody, like, just gently kicked him in his back, and his whole fucking shit went. And he ended up in a wheelchair. Yeah, but that was Dang. that was so from like, that was know, from that, all the That's way how the business goes. Years, and if you're if you're getting in the ring and taking those risks, that's how it goes. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <clears throat> but that's you know that's wear and tear throughout the years and fucking sacrificing your body. Oh too, yeah, and, yeah, which yeah, which I, you know a lot about. You know what I mean? Because I mean, uh, it's funny. I I think the die. It's funny the die hard NXT fans. I would like to think and maybe remember, but. Who knows? In this world, they just only remember what have you done for me lately? You know, what happened yesterday? What's going on right now? So, you know, you, you, when you're a pro wrestler, I, I love to think that, you know, I got a hard drive that I just brought you that has all this mm-hmm. footage of all of the guys we watched. Mm-hmm. Macho Man. You know, I just saw your Antonio Inoki toy mm-hmm. from Japan. It's like some great wrestling on that hard drive from the, the 80s Look, this and is, 90s. This Terry and, and, and I, Funk with Jimmy Hart. Yeah, and you, and you yeah, just yeah. love it. For Definitely. me, it, you know, especially in this world that we live in today where there's so much fucking politics and bullshit mm-hmm. and fucking propaganda shoved in your fucking face and down your throat, I, I like to disconnect. And and what better way to do so in the, the old school essence of like, yo, I plug this hard drive in, right? No <laughs> internet, no connection needed. Plug that motherfucking into any screen. And I got access to thousands of matches, a terabyte. It's just fucking, you know, all the old Saturday Night Main Event shit and all the old Clash of Champions and and AWA, NWA, WCCW. So for me, as an avid wrestling fan and a guy who uh, became more so a fan of great work done in the ring uh, during the course of my career as a a guy who never wrestled before I got to the WWE, just Mm. made a YouTube video, got lucky, got a tryout, got in. That's and crazy. That was it. So, I mean, I oh, had well, to help around. Nah, you got to talk, talk about that. I had to talk about that. So, wait a you second. You just can't see that. Like so, that. you've always been I can't been go into the backstory. Look it. I don't need no introduction. No, no, no. This, always look, go? motherfucker. <laughs> this is not a backstory. <laughs> look. All right. So, you always was an athlete. Could you play football? Yeah, I think that's the thing that was such a misconceived notion, especially in where I'm going and wrestling now as a a guy who got back into the ring after, you know, a two, three-year hiatus now. Uh, Just getting my wheels turning again and, and, uh, you know, uh, and and that's in the mental sense as much as in the physical sense and and just getting back out there. I, I would rather not just jump back out on television. You know, I would rather go work in these small opportunities to meet fans, engage them, shake their hand, get out there, feel the crowd. Right. Ways that you can't explain how it is that you get better at this craft. It's, you know, work in those small rooms just like fucking you do on the comedy scene. And mm. you do when you're making music. You know, when you get over with that audience that's in that small room, you know one day, like, yeah, this 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 could work, you know, in a big way. 
And I always had that opportunity in NXT and in Florida Championship Wrestling. Now that I'm not out there on television right now, it's like, how do you get your wheels turning again? It's like there's a whole independent market of pro wrestling, especially reemerging during the uh, you know post-COVID era where people are hungry to see shows. And you go down to places like Texas, where I've been over the past three months. Uh, I've had I've had two, great matches, though. I've, I've had <laughs> wrestle a 25-minute match against what I perceive to be one of the best promos in pro wrestling. Uh, one of the guys that can work the stick. And uh, how do I know that, right? It's because when you're in the WWE Farm League system, formerly known as Florida Championship Wrestling, then became WWE NXT, the guys who were in that locker room, we literally built the Performance Center. And what do I mean by that? There's seven rings in that place where the WWE has all their training going on. And there's a giant weight room in that place. And we built all those rings as the talent that was on the roster at the time. And we built that weight room. And we and we were the first guys to get in those rings. And one of those guys that would every Wednesday night crush promo class for Dusty Rhodes. Just like, man, he was a top five promo every week. Like, you watch 70, 80 people go up and down a, on, on a Wednesday night down the roster and everybody talks their shit and you got 30 seconds or 90 seconds anywhere in between and uh you know you get those great those 90 second opportunities could change your life get you an opportunity and, and some of those promos you know that they called on some guys did change their life uh so got opportunities out of it you know you got a guy like triple h at promo class before they're doing an nxt taping and uh, you got Michael Cole there, and you got Dusty Rhodes sitting there, and they're watching you speak for the first time. You know, that can, that can make or break you right there. You just don't know. <coughs> so this motherfucker held on to his job for a while, having been there for maybe a couple of years. And, and he went from Florida Championship Wrestling to NXT. And this guy, uh, he went by Knuckles Madsen in NXT, and, and currently he goes by, you know, Ivan Warsaw. He was one of the craziest motherfuckers I met. I mean, just fucking nuts. So you met Warsaw and NXT back then? fucking nuts. Warsaw had the craziest promos, bro. Hmm. He went up there and he was like, and Bray Wyatt wanted him. Bray Wyatt was like, yo, put him in the Wyatt family. family. He was like, put him in the Wyatt family. Put him in the Wyatt family. He pitched it a bunch. And they didn't put him in the Wyatt family because they thought, like, Bray didn't need anybody else to, like, talk for him. And Mm. they didn't, and then maybe, you know, Warsaw came up with this other gimmick where he was a clown because he was originally a tag team partner with Doink the Clown, Matt Bourne, the original Doink. So he knew Matt Bourne real well and tag team with him. And, you know, he got a tryout to the WWE and he had never been big on the indies. He's from like Arkansas. Hmm. So they saw him and they were like, this guy can work. And he learned a lot from Doink the Clown, just being a fan of the business. And I thought when I get back into pro wrestling, one of the first things I need to do is go out there and let the world know who the fuck this guy is. Like, any favor I can do him, fuck it. You know, I, I mean, that's my MO right now is going out there and working guys for 20 minutes that I know can go 20. You know, that can go out there and, and improvisationally work the bullet points in between. You know, like, if I'm going to wrestle your arm, you know, for, fucking go arm for an arm. Hmm. You know, like, you know... You get me back up and you call something and you take a powder and roll out of the ring. Real old school wrestling that me and you love and watch to wrestle now. And back then, because you don't see it anymore. You see a whole choreographed scene take place in front of you. And, and guys don't uh, really convince you of the emotions. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't talk backstage? You're jipping the people if you don't talk to the guy you're going to wrestle backstage. You're jipping them because you're not putting the work in to make it great. But does that mean you need to overproduce it and go out there and, and, and run a choreographed Broadway play? Mm. Like, you can do that and get the people and get them behind you. And, and you know, no, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's wrong if you're over and you're selling merchandise and people like you. So I'm not going to go out there and say you're wrong for what you're doing. But the old school wrestling me and you watch, you know, Macho Man, Jake the Snake, ran, and you, know, you know, it was just different work. And I would love when I get back into the ring – to bring a little bit of that from the great guys that taught me how to wrestle. See, I went down to Florida Championship Wrestling, and I worked with a guy like, you know, Ivan Warsaw. Got in the ring with him, and I was a guy who never wrestled before in my fucking life. I made a YouTube video that went viral, Barstool Sports. Victor Cruz was going to the Super Bowl to play for the Giants. I played against him in high school football. I had a highlight reel of me German suplexing him. I was talking shit uh, about the Jersey Shore. Next thing I know, I get a try out in the WWE through knowing the strength coach who works with Triple H. Because of my college football days, see, uh, now, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to 
go to the NFL. I never, I, I had a terrible injury in college, but I never thought I had a chance to go into the NFL. You know, undersized. You know, I'm, I'm 5'11", 200 pounds. That's undersized in the NFL. You know, if you're not fucking running a 4'5". I didn't run no 4'5", but I didn't run no 5'0". I was a fucking fast fucking dude, you know? Like, what position you play? Level. Strong <laughs> safety, outside linebacker. Uh, you know, rolled up and blitzed and, and had, a, had a field day playing football, loved the game, but saw it as a way to get into wrestling because I went to the school that John Cena went to. Mm. And I got an opportunity to speak to John Cena my freshman year, and I asked him, how do I become a pro wrestler? And he said, to have your coach, you know, call when you, uh, when you graduate. Mm. I said, fuck it. You know, and I got kicked out of college, and, uh, you know, for being too awesome. So then I went to another <laughs> college. <laughs> Went to another college, strength coach, tattooed his logo on my leg for a free lifetime membership because I was so broke I couldn't afford to train at the best place where all the best athletes were training. And I was, you know, I was I was fucking first team all North Jersey, fucking, you know, psychopath on the field, fucking had a mohawk, wore number 21, kick returner, punt returner, running back, safety, you know, did everything on the field. The Iron Man game, just never stepped off the field. And I know a guy like Brian Cushing, who I grew up with and trained with, who played in the NFL, was Rookie of the Year for the Houston Texans, was a psycho. Like, we, I grew up with some fucking sick athletes. Victor Cruz played against him all throughout, you know, high school and shit. So I was a good athlete. When I was in the WWE, being a good athlete didn't make much money. Hmm. Uh, what made money? <clears throat> the Rock made money. <laughs> be the Rock. The whole goal was to be... The Rock. I mean, I loved The Rock. Had the pleasure of meeting him once, and it was enough. Because he was as cool as people say he is. And then he took a picture with me and posted it on his Instagram. Wow. And said how much he appreciated his story with meeting me. And, uh, man, sometimes, like, people don't realize, like, man, in those <clears throat> moments, like, I was able to, like, just say, like, yo, like, it may never get better than this. So mm, that's okay. Yeah. Like, dude, you did it. Like, like, try to remember that. Try Made to stay humble and yeah. just remember you're fucking Eric, you know, from fucking, you know, Jersey. fucking from Jersey and, and, you, and you're out here in these streets meeting people and they're knowing who you are. So just the fact that they know who you are in essence, like I met Hulk Hogan and he said, and I remember uh, Hulk Hogan was there and Bill DeMott was our head coach and we were in the performance center and it was the first time Hulk Hogan had done business with the WWE in a long time. And he lived in Tampa, and they just built the Orlando Performance Center, and we helped build that, thank you. And uh, <laughs> and Hulk Hogan comes in, and at the end, all the NXT crowd kids that are in the system, you know, making between 600 to $1,200 a week, all of us, selling out the Barclays Center, you know. So when y'all was but we were we were happy to have our jobs, and I'm making no mistake about it, I was great. So you said, one second, 600 to $1,200 a week. Yeah. Selling was, out the Barclays. Not only that, but just that was every wrestling every, every, every Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Saturday. Okay, but cool. we built that place. I mean, right. that, the, the the guys working at that time mm -hmm. built it. Built a. Built who who Florida. are some of the guys that that work with you? Uh, that so I was talking about some of the guys out here on these streets now. But uh, right before we get to that, we were on to something. What was it again? Does anybody recall? You know, rewind. Fuck. <laughs> no, you say. You Making this much oh, Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan. Oh, Hulk Hogan. Yeah, yeah. So the performance center, you know, man, you have an opportunity at the end of Hulk Hogan coming to speak to all the guys that are standing around the rings, you know, back to the fucking weight room. All the rings are in front of them. It's like, Hulk Hogan's going to take some questions from NXT. So I, I let some people ask questions. And I shut the fuck up. But I wasn't going to let that moment slip. So right before it was uh, done, I could tell when Hogan was about to be like, any last questions, you know? I, I waited. And when I raised my hand to say something, my coach at that time looked at me like, what the fuck? <laughs> I was so like, why do I get that treatment? I was like, fuck y'all. Fuck y'all. So I had something to say. And I said, what did you enjoy more? Your heel run or your baby face run? Mm. Good question. Mm. And then he's following to what he said in response. Well, Enzo. Oh, that's your name? <laughs> and I didn't hear anything he said after that. I don't know which one he liked better. Because <laughs> he said, well, Enzo, I looked at, like, side-eyed my coach who was just telling me not to ask a question, you know? Like, what the fuck? 
And that was kind of a moment for me where I kind of realized, like, holy shit. Like, bro, you're doing it. Like, you're fucking doing it. Like, Hulk Hogan knows who you are, bro. And the whole, and he just let everybody know in the room that he knows who you are. It's like, holy fuck. And later came to find out, probably found out because Jimmy Hart is my biggest fucking fan. Shout out Jimmy Shout out to the fucking mouth Hart. South, Jimmy. The mouth of the South. Jimmy Hart is one of one of my favorite guys to go back and watch now. When we go back and watch that shit. I mean, between him, Bobby the Brain Heenan, Jesse the Body Ventura, you know, uh, even going to those fucking, you know, Sean Mooney's of the day before Todd Pettengale and, like, some of the guys that they were using back then. And, dude, you watch Saturday Night's Main Event. They come out to... Hogan's doing a thing with Rocky, so they come out to Eye of the Tiger. He's got the white pants on. He's got the white belt. I watched the Saturday Night's Main Event the other day. It's maybe 11 27 86. Okay? Because it's Hogan... It, no, it's, it's Hogan versus... No, no, no. It's Macho Man versus Brett Hitman Hart in one of Brett's single matches without... And without Jim. <clears throat> and it's awesome. Hmm. I've got all the that. shit. I got I, everything. I mean, I got it right that. here. You know, I got prime time wrestling rolling right there. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna check it out eventually. But you know, I never did an interview with somebody, right? That just fucking controlled the whole interview the way I didn't. I looked at that ask question. You know, you don't need to. Right? I don't exactly. need to. Yeah, I, yeah I let mean, him I, go. Let I him go. It. But you know, even though there are millions of fucking, uh, <laughs> it's mil, it's millions in the real one hive, right? It's, you have a hive. You got the good <laughs> real one hive. It's millions, right? But then it's also this world of, of the personal dizzle. party of Smoke Dizzle. So you have that, a blunt lit the whole time to your lips, looking like you wanted to hear about some wrestling. I mean, look. I'm looking at action figures of pro wrestling. I thought I'd take liberties. I look. Well, what you wanted to say, show? Sometimes you, sometimes you don't Oh, he's got the Hulk Hogan shirt on. Look, but Actually, that is. Let me give you a backstory. I wore it for a reason. That shirt right there came from my Japan tour. Right, it's it's a rare. Tell me about Japan your Japan tour. There release, we go. Take the mic. Right, that was when Hulk Hogan went to Japan, and um and wrestled in Japan, and that actual yeah. photo was taken in Japan. Yeah, you know what I mean. That That's the actual. Hard. Yeah, I, I think I might have. I need that. I got. I, I, got, I, need I, that. I got one for you. Smoke. You know I mean? Where did you go in Japan? Did you hit Rapungi? I did hit Rapungi. I did, and um. Shit, I was all over Japan. I was in Yokohama. Um, I hit Finn, and Finn sent me to some fucking some place in Japan where I can get all these toys. I forget the district, but that's where I got that Antonio Inoki. I feel like I got a Abdullah the Butcher. I got that Scott Hall from Japan. I got a few toys from Japan, and that that amazing photo right there. That was my first show in Japan. So if I ever go wrestle in Japan, you go with me. You already know I'm on road. I'm ro- come on. We got we got that. the we got the nice concert hall. and we got the show. You know what yeah. I mean? So we we do both. But um, you know, like I said, you were the first cruiserweight champion to never lose the belt. I know you don't like talking about the past, right? But we're gonna talk about the past to get into the future. Cause you're a unique individual. And we don't even have to really get too much in depth. But I wanna say that anytime I seen you live on my TV screen, I knew you had something. A, I knew you had some good sneakers on. And you was coming you was coming with a you was coming with a good fit. And two Always Jordans. Let's not mix it up. Crazy always shit. always Only Jordan. one time I didn't wear Jordans. When? My last match in the WWE. Is that a bad omen, guys? Mm, what sneakers were you they wearing? They put me in LeBron's. Champ Sports just was back. Nothing wrong with that, though. I mean, I fuck, Champ with, I fuck with LeBron. Champ Sports begging me to wear those honeycomb-looking fucking LeBron's that were burgundy and black. Mm, you know? Didn't you have, like, a Champ Sports deal at that yeah, point? Yeah, first wrestler to ever have his own Jordan-made player exclusive. Mm. Handed to me. Shout out Marcus Jordan, Mike's son. Mm. Out there with the trophy room in Orlando. They always showed mad love. In Orlando, where where NXT really was born, where I made a name for myself, I'm the hottest spitter to make it out of Florida since Donald Duck. Baby Jordan, uh, fourteen, fourteen, uh, black never toe, heard that. black Crazy. toe, never heard that. Ferrari fourteen two was the first wrestling shoe that I ever wore, and the reason why I was able to understand what I had is because I just I had bro I I came into wrestling right, I had a half dyed blonde mohawk like it's blonde now. With brown sides, and I got the name Enzo Amore that I tried and pitched for. That was like a question. Motherfucker. 
because I wanted to keep EA, Eric Anthony. I wanted to keep the EA in my mm -hmm. name, right? Well, I get this name, and they tell me I got to dye my shit black. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm like, that don't stand out as much, but all right, if I want to be Enzo Amore from Jersey, I got to I got to dye my shit black. Shave a mustache, look like a fucking Jay Brown, wear spandex and boots. <laughs> well, I walked in for my first WWE photos. You can probably find them out there. I was fucking in great shape, had a good tan. All right, blonde mohawk, five o'clock shadow, but was wearing all black boxing drunks like Mike Tyson and those black Roy Jones Jr. fucking um, Jordans boxing boots that mm. were fly as shit if you know them they have blue ones that were like royal blue and black that are just so hard you gotta find those but uh and high black knee pads and i was like mike tyson like fuck this man i'm wearing all black like mike like, tyson I, tyson mm -hmm. black bo boxing trunks and they were like you gotta wear tights and i was like what the fuck my friends are gonna make fun of me back home imagine me trying to tell a story <laughs> like, imagine me trying to come out here like this so, man, they took me, stripped me down, man. They were like, yo, you can't. I walked out for the curtain for my first ever match, and they told me I couldn't wear no chains. I had on a bunch of gold chains. They told me I couldn't wear them. I had on a jacket. He's like, lose the jacket. Damn. I'm like, what the fuck, man? Now I'm out here in just a pair of spandex pants and boots. I'm like, geez, bro. It was the most awkward I've felt, but I went through the curtain, bro, and I just said, fuck it. And I went so crazy with my body moving so fast in ways that if you saw me on a silhouette wrestling you would go yeah that's Enzo <laughs> I went through the curtain and fell like twice because I lost so much control of my body coming through the curtain but I had everyone's attention bro I had them by the balls and I was walking all around the ring and making eye contact with everybody and talking shit mm. by the time I got in the ring with Big E he was, he was laughing Big E, <laughs> Big e couldn't well, shout out to my brother mm -hmm. Big E shout the out Big E, e my him. first ever match yeah. Wow, love that man so he wanted to give me some things in that match. And Bill DeMott was like, straight through. You're finished three times right away. I'm like, what? So I'm just going out there to get stripped down. Can't have no promo. But I said, you know what? Fuck this, man. I don't need a microphone to talk in this armory. Everybody can hear me if I fucking talk loud. So I just fucking cut my promos, boy. And I was talking shit all the way around the ring, all the way up until I took Big East finish. And he was cracking, you know. He was, like, trying to hold it together. He hit me with his gimmick. But his finish was five, right? So at, rather than a three count, he would make the referee count, count for five. five. I remember that. And that was in <laughs> NXT. Mm -hmm. I remember that. So he beats me with his finish That's for five. five, and he hits me with his shit. Then he hits me again with his shit, and I shoot myself up in the air and do a flip. And my boss wanted to kill me, but I didn't know that. Then he hits me up, five count. He hits me with his finish again. I do another one, and I spike myself on my head and hold myself there and die. And I have the crowd, and I don't even know it. And I don't know what the boys are thinking upstairs, but I have a curtain sellout. And Bray Wyatt is crying. And he's like, that guy is over with me for life. I don't give a fuck <laughs> what anybody says. And Bray Wyatt took me under his wing that day, and I was under his wing until the day I left. He was good to me. I love that guy. I love Wyndham. Uh, but, man, it was it was... That that match, I went through that. I did that twice with Big E. And then I went to TVs, never for one second thinking of the TV taping. I was going to get my name called mm -hmm. to go out there. Hmm. And the day I went out, John Cena just happened to be there. Mm -hmm. And when I saw Cena backstage, I said, uh, hey, man, when I was at Springfield when we won, we used to play Take Me Home tonight in the locker room on the football team. Did they play that when you were there? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh. And he just kind of walked off. Then it, when I went out to debut, all the boys knew I was supposed to get fired, so they all stood up and clapped for me. Like, here's, <laughs> here's Enzo's one chance, you know what I'm saying? Like, all the boys, like, e, Big E, everybody. And, uh, man, I went out there, and John Cena heard all the boys clapping. So he came out to see what they were all clapping for. And it was my debut, and I had the mic, and I said, bada boom, real sky in the room. And John Cena was backstage, repeated me, and then asked to meet me when I got out of the ring. And then he asked me if I wanted to go to the ring and hold the microphone and talk. And I told him I had a tag team partner at the time that I didn't. And I didn't realize I was going over people's head when I said, oh, that guy, Big Cass, is my tag team partner. So I booked it. Next thing I know, I'm out there with John Cena with Big Cass. And we're just, we said soft, S-A-W-F-T, soft. John Cena repeated it and the whole crowd said it in NXT. And from that day on, we were on that show. And we didn't, and we did not know what. Every time we showed up to TV, we thought we weren't going to be on it. 
they told us we weren't going to be on it. And then when we got there, they'd hand us a script and be like, you guys got your gear? And we'd be like, oh, shit. We had no idea. <laughs> we didn't even know what was going on, bro. And we just got out there and we got over with that little Orlando crowd that loved us and uh, loved other guys on NXT, too. It became a real hot show. And then that took me to the WWE uh, main stage. And it parlayed very, you know, smoothly for me. Uh, you know, NXT to WWE. Um, I was a part of the group of guys that put NXT on the map. But, uh, you know, if we really are honest, I mean, it was me and Big Cass music that hit to open the first ever NXT show to hit Columbus, Ohio, to leave Florida. The mm. first music to hit when we left to the UK. The first music to ever hit when we left and hit UK soil. First music to ever hit in the Barclays Center when NXT did the Barclays for the first time. And, uh, you know, it, 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 was a, it was an honor and a privilege to, to work at, at that time. You know what I mean? From right. some, from such a hot show and uh, shit, man, I will, give, I will give so many guys credit in the locker room, big cast included and myself, you know, for making a hell of a show that's I've got a cable contract now. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. So uh, it was it was it was a hell of a time to wrestle, and a lot of those guys are out here on that sh on the street. You asked me about that, which mm -hmm. guys to work with. Uh, you know, uh, Aiden English was great. Um, Buddy Murphy and Wesley Blake had some killer matches. Scott Dawson and, and Dash Wilder that are Cash uh, Wheeler and, and Dax Harwood on uh, One AEW. Of the best tag teams in the world. Yeah, definitely. And they would tell you, you know, some of the most fun they ever had in their lives was opening those NXT shows, you know, uh, dancing with Enzo and Cass, mm -hmm. learning a lot. I mean, we all learned a lot because those are the first big shows we ever done, any of us, any of us. And Enzo and Cass were the most over tag team probably in the history of that NXT brand. Mm -hmm. And the first one to ever really come out of it, you know, really come out of it and transition onto the main roster as smoothly as we did. So, like... You know, Dash and Dawson were just perfect heels for us to work with. I mean, wow, were they good. Those guys are great. Mm -hmm. That UK show that I had with them ranks up there, if not the one of my favorite shows that I ever did in my life. Like, mm -hmm. like, wow. The hottest crowd ever. They came up with the Oh, Enzo Amore. Oh, in, in the UK. In the UK versus... That, that makes sense. Because that's, that's like a soccer kind of yeah chance so chant. it makes sense okay. that that would be you know put together in the uk now to to update my listeners you know what i mean that that may be listening to this like oh this is just some smoke nerd shit he's on his wrestling shit today all right look. it's okay no it's, i know yeah. no it's okay it's great so so numbers um, guys. so so look the, the, the methods so, and the numbers you so, know what the numbers are so a promo right is talking shit all right and being over is being liked, okay? And then when if you ever hear the word shoot, that means real. So now I want to get into shoot real fast. So what the fuck happened when you left the WWE? Well, bro, I mean, it's, it's, it's the craziest situation of all time. I mean, I've, I, I never got a phone call from police, uh, you know, because there was there, a, a girl... During the height of the of the, the Me Too thing, right? That the mm -hmm. fucking shit is white hot. And we're doing a women's revolution in pro wrestling. And the first ever women's Royal Rumble is on Sunday. And it's the 25th anniversary of Monday Night Raw. And they're doing the Manhattan Center and the Barclays Center. And I just come fresh off of main eventing the first ever 205 Live tour that Sunday. So we took the Cruiserweight tour on the road with the title, doing our own shows at the Mid-Hudson Civic Center, which is the legendary building where Monday Night Raw was shot and I watched as a kid. So it was an honor and a privilege to wrestle my last WWE match, win for the title in that building. Because when I came to Raw the next day, I went through rehearsals with a match with Goldust. The Dudleys oh, were God. supposed to come out, interrupt, put me through a <coughs> table. I go back. I had lost my title and my clothes early in the night, wrestled this match in my underwear because I'm sitting at a table with the APA playing poker, this wrestling, you know, uh, you know, tandem that were super popular for playing you poker. You don't have to explain it. The millionaire, Ted DiBiase, wins my title. I lose it. Heavy. I go back through the curtain after my match with Goldust, and I see Alexa Bliss. And I try to get Alexa Bliss to get me my title back, and then we start making out. 
And then Nia Jax comes busting through the door with my that title. Was angle at the to, time. To, with my title to give me my title back, she won playing poker for me. And me and Nia had a flirt thing. And then what better way to turn me into a super bad guy in pro wrestling, right? Than to do this. Right. Okay. Well, well, I was the biggest bad guy in pro wrestling at that time, who was also the biggest baby face in the company the year before. So I went from being the most popular guy in pro wrestling to turning heel and becoming the biggest heel in pro wrestling, going out with the title to nightclubs, hanging out with you know celebrities, and just making it crazy and having a real fun time with it. Well, that life can you know come to bite you in the ass because quite frankly, you know, if you get rich and you get famous, should you have to apologize for going out in public and wanting to meet people and get laid? I mean, what the fuck are we talking about? Guys? Why did you go out there? And- why did you go out there in the first place, I'm all right? that type of time. So, you know, when I used to want to, when I was a kid in my 20s, I'd go out to the bar. When I was in NXT, spend nights striking out in Orlando and walking back. You know, now I'm Enzo Amore, and I'm going out to the bar, and everybody's buying me a drink, and my dinner's paid for, and people want to meet you. And it's just wild. You're famous for the first time once. So, you know, on the 25th anniversary of Raw, a girl that I had met in Phoenix accused me of sexually assaulting her, and it went viral. And it caught fire while I'm sitting in the Barclays Center getting ready to go out for Monday Night Raw. They send me home and knee-jerk reaction, fire me the next day. Which I can understand at the time because if you if you imagine me going out there in front of a crowd, could you imagine? I was already the hottest heel in the company. I would have came out to fucking crazy chance. Would have been a really bad look for the company. The Royal Rumble, (laughs) first ever women's Royal Rumble. I get the timing of it. But make no mistake about it. The police had never contacted me one time about an investigation or any shit like that. So, you know, I uh, essentially uh, had to pay a lawyer out in Florida to do an investigation of his own. And basically what we found out was the girl who would fucking, you know, uh, popped on a drug test, was going to fucking rehab, had her dad at her house, called the cops on her. She said she got date raped when she got drug tested, and they had to fucking write it down, right? But nobody believed her. The dad didn't believe her. The police didn't believe her, and they sent her off to rehab. Hmm. Well, she's off at rehab, you know, popped on her drug test. She's fucking violating whatever the fuck she's got going on in her life. And then she just happens to be sitting home, and she sees wrestlers trying it on Twitter, and goes, holy shit, oh, yeah. Six, seven months later, you know, mm. like this, this Yo, happened to me fuck? in the biggest, craziest fashion in the history. And then I said, fuck this, took a five month social media silence and didn't apologize for shit. Said, fuck you. You know, is yeah. Ric Flair out here apologizing for the life he lived? You know what I mean? Like, motherfucker, I'm, I'm living my life. So I'm not apologizing for shit. I didn't do anything wrong here. So, you know, there's nothing to be fucking sorry for. So why the fuck would I apologize? So I came out and I realized, you know, when I came out, archived my whole Instagram and trended number one in the world, I was like, holy shit, I got something here. Well, I dropped my music video and had an impromptu meet and greet in Times Square that put 4,500 people in Times Square. That was insane. And I realized in that moment when Times Square sold out for me that I don't know any apologies, I don't know any explanations, my music video I just dropped Phoenix does all the explaining I ever need to do. You know, just basically raising a middle finger and saying, you know, like, I'm not one of those. So I'm not sinking into this fucking PR campaign of fucking apologizing. Y'all can kiss my ass. I'm the realest in the room. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I mean, yo, yo, yo. You, got, you get Tupac, you get Mike Tyson. So they did shit. time for that shit. Yeah. You know, my heart breaks for those men when I think about Pac and Tyson and what they went through. You know, they tried to get me. Real I'm shit. I'm uncancelable. I came at them with lawyers, mm. paid money for lawyers, and said, fuck you. Yeah. And then I bought a ticket to the WWE Survivor Series, and I let them know I'm out here in these streets. <laughs> I'm a one-man brand, <laughs> yeah. and I'm not, yeah. not going to be but, disrespected. And, but they got you the fuck out of there, though. I, mean, I, got, I got myself your, the fuck out of there. Your dignity. I kept myself you the fuck up out of there. That's a fact. You kept your dignity. I fuck that. I walked out that bitch and had an Uber ready. I had an Uber ready. My Uber was already called by the time I stood up. What the fuck we talking about? <laughs> Yo, I fucking like yeah. this dude. I fucking like this dude, man. I showed up to their pay per view. I showed up to their pay per view. I stood up in the air. I stood up in the air. I gave the finger. 
Because it wasn't though. more or less a finger to like the company that helped me more than anything in the world. I love them. But this For is sure. pro wrestling. For and sure. anything fucking goes. For and sure. I'm out here in these streets now. And I'm not going to have you drag dirt on my name, remove me from your database, make it so that you can't search me, tarnish my name. Nah, nah, nah. Like, I'm, I'm going to let you know. Like, I'm doing all right. I can afford your $2,500 fucking front row ticket to give you the finger. Like, you know, I'm, I, I saved my money. I fucking invested. I diversified my motherfucking assets. <laughs> <laughs> now, look. Now, look. Yo. Uh, we, <laughs> now, <laughs> as you can see, this is my friend. So we have these conversations even more wilder off record. Oh. But, you know, even during the time in the height, you know, I will come to L.A., come to the crib. You know what I mean? We shoot the shit, whatever. Hell yeah, you pulled like, up, brought the whole crew, had the Polaroids flipping. Yeah, you feel me? We were feel out me? there. And, I, it was and a tell good time. about the crib in L.A. The crib in L.A. was amazing. It was some Fresh print shit. I was out there with all my friends from yeah, high school. Yeah, it was my good. little brother, who, by the way, today is DPing Post Malone. I don't want to say what music video, who's on it. Just look out for it. He's working with Cole brand. Bennett, Lyrical Lemonade. Shout him out. I'll shout give him a shout out. out. Never shout met out Cole yet. But I know he and my brother are tight, and they're out there working and uh, making making movies, man. So I'm excited for what holds, you know, for my brother, you, who you know well, too. Right, shout out to Brett. You live a good life. You live a great life. You've been very blessed. We, are, we all have been very blessed to do what we do. Um, do you miss being in, in the field, so to speak? Well, you would know because you're my homie that for two years I did not want to be in the limelight. I was, yeah, definitely working on the music, releasing it here and there. But, like, bro, I did not want to be on TV wrestling for no WWE. And they were the only place to go at the time. Right. And even when AEW kicked off, you knew I, you were hitting me up about it right away. I was like, even if that was an option right now, I'm not ready. Right. Like, I needed time to mend. Like, you hate wrestling for a little while. You're sour grapes. Your body's aching. You're motherfucking hurting. Your back... You know, you go through trials and tribulations physically post wrestling when your body's just so used to a certain way of life mm -hmm. that all of a sudden you're you were just did three hundred on the road, which by the way, I might be the last ever Iron Man pro wrestler. And shout out anybody in the WWE who doesn't want to give me credit. <laughs> yeah, he you know is. it's true because they stopped doing live events. Mm. <clears throat> and the last guy to ever work a full time schedule in the WWE was me. Mm. I did SmackDown on Tuesdays. Everybody who did Raw and or SmackDown, which they there was times in life where guys wrestled, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, whenever they did SmackDown and Raw, they did both, right? Whenever they filmed it. Well, when you're on 205 Live, they, they you know, they, they Neville before me and then I, after Neville, uh, anchored the program. So what does that mean? You go out there, there's one cruiserweight match on, uh, you want to work for the biggest promotion in pro wrestling in the world, you got eight matches on the card, okay? You got your heavyweight title match on top in the main. Probably got your women's title match, semi-main. Got women's tag team title match, probably after intermission. Uh, no offense, ladies. Um, I see. All uh, right, you, you got your intercontinental title, mm -hmm. all right, working out there. Mm -hmm. You got your... Um, a rubber match, maybe, or something. You got a rubber match, which is... Uh, a, a battle royal with a bunch of guys in it or, or a 16-man, you know, eight-on-eight eight tag match. Mm -hmm. Basically, because if somebody misses their flight or travel, you need to be able to have pull, pull from that match and put them and insert them into another match. Mm -hmm. Okay? So you need a roster there just to be able to, you know, and people love entrances more than they love the actual wrestling. I want to see right. guys come to the curtain hear the music. So you got your four title matches right there, right? You got your cruiserweight title match. That's five. You got your men's tag team title match. That's six. Mm -hmm. Okay, we mentioned the rubber match is mm -hmm. seven. Mm -hmm. That leaves one more match on the whole fucking card for a rivalry match. Mm -hmm. A match that has a star in it, mm -hmm. so you don't need a title. Mm -hmm. Right? That's Enzo and Cass in the opener. Enzo and Cass opening every show for NXT without titles needing to be a title match. Enzo and Cass opening every Raw show when we first hit the scene. Because we didn't need titles. We were the song and dance guys that got the crowd hype. So we were perfect for the opener. And it became a great slot for us in our in our prime as a tag team. So that was an honor and a privilege. I mean, that was fucking cool as shit. You only get eight opportunities in the biggest fucking company in the world to go out there and fucking, you know, and there's only one opener and one, one closer. And, and those are the most important spots to be in. So when I say I'm the last Iron Man wrestler, I did it to another extreme. 
I was working heavily on the program, so I had a lot of opportunity to speak with producers and writers, a lot of which didn't like me, you know, because I, 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 I stuck up for myself. And you, you want me to say, how are you? And I want to say, how you doing? So we're not seeing eye to eye on this. Right. I, you know, I got something I want to say here. And you're not the one with the mic who's got to go out there and live and die by the sword. It's easy mm. for you to sit out here in a suit and tie and tell me how to do Enzo. Mm. But I get it. Maybe you're getting her down from the top. But that's the problem. A lot of the times it trickled from, okay, a Vince McMahon tells a producer, a producer tells a writer, a writer relays us what we're doing. Well, producers at the ring to go talk about the match, the writers who we talk to behind this curtain to talk about our promo well if i'm not getting it i'll go knock on vince's door and guys don't have that luxury guys don't have the balls to do it hmm. and i don't know if i was loved or hated for it but motherfucker i got in there was there and i talked line? to vince a lot and by the time i was cruiserweight <clears throat> champion i was in the main event all the time i was fucking in you know in, in an opportunity to fucking open that door and, and talk to him and so i told vince i wanted to open shows on friday with the cruiserweight title on the road. And I wanted to close 205 Live in the main event on Tuesday. <coughs> on Tuesday, I wanted to go nine innings. Hmm. I wanted to fucking open the show and close the fucking show. You know what I'm saying? And I got that opportunity. So on my last run in the WWE, I was opening every Friday. You know what I'm saying? On the cruiserweight match, uh, if we weren't right before intermission, which is a great spot also first half main event so it was a great spot and the cruiserweight division was hot and we were i was hot and 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 to be able to do that after you look at the scenario okay well nobody goes out there as cruiserweight champion wrestles on friday saturday sunday monday tuesday it's done the wwe stopped doing live events pandemic happened will we ever go back to that format will anyone ever do 300 on the road again i might be the last iron man to ever fucking do it. <laughs> he, he explained that shit. Crazy. Now, you said, you know, you would knock on Vince's door. Was there a long line outside of that door? Of, of oh, talent I mean, talking? fuck. Maybe if there wasn't even a long line, it, it was closed for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Good knock on that door. So, so the, you said, you mentioned the, um, producers and writers hated you and that was a question no 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 there was but, one producer who accidentally texted me one time uh i fucking hate enzo he meant to text it to another agent and he uh, pulled up yeah, adam yeah. pierce backstrom was his name i think he's one of the lead writers there to be quite honest he wow. texted me on accident uh i fucking hate enzo he fucking blah 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 and i see it come in and i'm already on my way to seattle i'm done with fucking 205 i mean i'm done with monday night raw in, 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 in Portland, and I'm on my way to Seattle for 205 Live. Mm. And I just sent him back my dancing emoji. <laughs> <laughs> I know he, yo, can you imagine? And then he hit me back faces. with that goddamn apology like you wouldn't even believe, a novel of an apology. I didn't even respond. I went out there, had a great night in Seattle. Are you shit me? I'm <laughs> fucking, I'm fucking, are you, Hater. Are, you, are you kidding me, bro? Actually, that wild night was an all-nighter. I didn't sleep, went straight into Seattle, and I'll never forget the first fucking, first fucking line that came out, because I was like, Yo, I was like, Seattle, I'm a certified G, and the G ain't for grunge, it's Gucci. <laughs> That's fire. And I was, I was fucking dripping, <clears throat> I was dripping in Gucci, and I was playing that heel character up, and I was living the life, uh, you know, just out there. I ne if I've never been to Seattle and now I got people there that want to take me out because I've been there maybe once or twice now. And maybe I got some fans in Seattle that are celebrities or got money and they want to take you out and they want to show you all the things that the city has to offer. That's how you're supposed to reap the reward of getting yourself out there, of being famous, of fucking networking, of having this opportunity that you never had before in your life elsewise to go see places and do things on an elite caliber. Whereas, you know, you go to Australia and you're in the WWE and they introduce you to Steve Irwin's wife and then his kids and they hand you koalas and kangaroos and you're fucking living the dream. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you network with these people and you're like, next time I'm in Australia, I'm hitting you up, Steve Irwin's kid. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I got opportunities to really see places and I made a lot of great friends along the way in different cities. So, you know, that could get you into some fucking trouble when you're fucking going out as much as I was. 
You know what I mean? But I'm never going to apologize for that. You know, I'm certainly living a different lifestyle now. And I, mm-hmm. I mean, we none, and, and, and if not by choice, if not by choice. I mean, fuck, COVID happened. Nobody's going out. I mean, mm-hmm. Nobody's out here living a crazy lifestyle. And me, I have a girlfriend, so it, it's a different lifestyle. But, you know, back when I was young and famous for the fucking first time and doing it for the first time, I'm, shit, man, I have a hell of a network now. I, I owe that to the goddamn good time I had. <laughs> <laughs> well, you <shit>. know... <clears throat> Being on the road as a rapper and a wrestler, you know, outside of you guys, you know, sacrificing, actually sacrificing your bodies, pause, just out there, just, you know, getting banged up, bruised up, you know, we we all have to deal with people. And and what me and you have in common is, is giving every person their moment, whether we tired, whether we aggravated. Me and you just had this conversation about a celebrity who I will not name. Right. We we won't. But we won't. but but I we, wanted to say that to say, you know, even when you were a hill, you were still doing make a wish. You were still, oh man, you you know, were that's, still I would one of say, the top faces in the company. Still. That, the, the picture on my Instagram <laughs> is a picture of me on the greatest day of my life. Talk about it. That is on my Instagram profile. And I have never changed it since that very day. And I still keep in touch with the real Enzo. Hmm. How you doing? Uh, Vincenzo is out there. Uh, he was living in North Carolina. They moved back to Florida, from my understanding. Uh, I got to get back in touch with his, uh, his dad. I'll give him a shout after this. It's a good idea. But Vincenzo, I got word of when I was in Germany through Stephanie McMahon, who contacted one of the producers who was backstage to crazy. get in touch with me. I was backstage in Germany about to have a wrestling match for the Cruiserweight title when... Uh, a contact came to me and said, Enzo, there's a kid. We want you to say, uh, cut a promo. Um, his name is Vincenzo, and he's got leukemia, and he's not doing well. And uh, he wants to meet you, and they're going to set up and make a wish. He's your biggest fan in the world. He dances around. He looks like you. He's, he, he dresses like you. He cuts promos. So they show me a little video of him, and I was like, oh, my God. My heart just chewed. Oof. That was the craziest. So I instantly, man, I wrote a letter, bro greatest letter I've ever written and it was the realest shit and I somehow memorized it like a promo within minutes of right. writing and then I said hold the camera and I cut this promo and then that was like the first day of tour and I was wearing white Jordans Jordan once and I just started writing down every match I was having on these Jordans and I wore those Jordans so those all white Jordan ones with red laces and I wrote down every match I had in them for the next two months because I told them in Germany that I wanted to fly home and meet him immediately and I have one off day and I'm coming off tour and I'm willing to use that one off day to go meet him right now. And they said, no, he's going to get he's going to get back on his feet and we're going to film it and we're going to make it a big to-do, make a wish. And I was like, what, what, what are we waiting for? I was like, let, let, let me go. Just tell me. So I went to the office and I tried to get contact <laughs> info. And I asked, and I said, give me the contact info of the kid. And they wouldn't give it to me. And then Stephanie, bless her heart, came to me and said that she wanted to make this a big thing and do a make-a-wish or whatever. Well, um, you know, Stephanie never wronged me. So, I, and I, I have this weird feeling she tried to make up for it in a weird way. So, I go to Orlando for 205 Live, and they have it set up to meet this little kid. And I see him. And when I roll up on him, man, I got the entire letter that I wrote him written on one Jordan. And the other has filled with like 15, 20 matches that I've had now. And I come up to him, bro, and I just <coughs> I lost it. It's like, dude, he had on a, uh, I can't even get emotional. He had on a certified G t-shirt and his dad and his mom and everybody was so over the moon. And he just kicked out. And he had hair on his head and he was doing good. And now he's better than ever. And uh, he can't do things, you know, like physically. He can't be a wrestler if he wanted to be. He can't. But he wants to get into acting and shit. And Lord knows one day if I have an opportunity, I'll help him. But I know when I make my return to wrestling, well, I'm there, right? Fire. Yeah, definitely. Because they never got to show that shit. So that was the hardest part. So they never showed that shit after I got fired. And, and, and I changed my picture on Instagram that day. Uh, and fuck, bro. Like, they never showed it. So then all of a sudden they do Undercover Boss with Stephanie McMahon being the undercover boss. And I'm already gone from the company, and this kid's on on uh, on TV 
wearing a certified GT shirt. They've already excommunicated me. I'm gone. Mm. But you still put him out there on Undercover Boss, the big time show on like ABC, and he's wearing the certified GT shirt, and there's no mention of me at all or anything. And who's the Undercover Boss? Stephanie McMahon. Mm. She comes out to greet him. And I'm like, in my heart of hearts, I'm like, it could have been a wrestler, could have been somebody. But I felt like she wanted to do that to let me know because she knew I wanted to do that shit that day. And I could have made that kid's fucking life. And it never went out there like that. Mm. And they never showed any of that footage and we've still never seen it. So whenever and if ever I make my return, make sure that motherfucker's there. You know what I'm saying? Mm. The real one. Man. RNS, man. The real one. That's the real, real one. Right you see, I ask that I ask that because I know the heart you have outside of all of this shit. And I oh know. yeah, we do this for the kids, man. Right. I, Fuck know, yeah, bro. It's, it's all about getting. You gotta remember, like you're moment. an adult and you're out there. People trying to make like wrestling real and talking to bro, mm-hmm. like I don't give a fuck. Fuck what people type about me, bro. You know that. People thought I got knocked out by a DDT a few weeks ago. <laughs> Sports <laughs> Illustrated. Don't even get, just let it let it go. Let it, it was, go. It was K-Fabe, good. K-Fabe, guys. It was go good. To, it was collar, <laughs> collar and elbow brand dot com. Support the real one. Buy a shirt. It says K-Fabe all day, every day. Now every you can day. tell them what K-Fabe is. So K-Fabe is basically, you know, what we believed as a kid to be real. Um, K- K-Fabe. Toast to the realness. Toast to the realness. Toast to the realness. Got me emotional on here. Where did that come from? Right? Because that I happens. know you. You my friend in this. this. A it happens on this, on this podcast because you know, you, we have personal well, conversations. We, so right. So the auto promos, right? Like you, you know. Another- shout out to the weed, real quick. Kept me off the bottle. Kept me off the pills. <laughs> Saved my life. Shout out to the Godfather, my OG. I really shout did. out to the Godfather. I re- I love weed. I as you see, yeah, yeah. I, my whole life is, is, is built Change is built around message. weed some kind of way. So, right, so <clears throat> I want to get into the art of promos. So, you know, um, like, another reason why a lot of us got into to, to Enzo on, on television was because of your promos and how <coughs> you, you, you tie in pop culture and you have a rapper approach because you're an actual artist. So before I was a wrestler, before you, right? I was discovered a rapper, made a wrestler. Let's not get this twisted. Boom, right? So over there, it's writers and producers, because you know, it's a conglomerate of a show. But with a talent like you, it's hard to edit what you do, or even, I mean, you can give an opinion, but how heavy, how heavy was the opinion given to you? And cut I owe promos. it. I owe it all to two people. Who? Cool. And I don't know how much of it was one, but I know one was definitely. So I owe it all to Triple H and Dusty Rhodes. Two goats. Two goats. Uh, Triple H, and he's the guy who ran NXT, right? So he gave me a microphone, and Dusty Rhodes, I believe, is the guy that told him to, and I believe that both of them went against any naysayer uh, that there was. And said, fuck it, put him out there. Like, fuck it. He, he never did this before, but he's going to have to figure it out because these people love him. And uh, and I had to figure it out, man. And fuck, fuck, fuck. Was, How did that feel the first day? I had no idea what the fuck was really going on, bro. I was just fucking riding the wave, like, trying to make sense of it all. Riding in cars with some of the best wrestlers in the world at the time, just shutting up and listening to them talk about their matches and uh, watching their matches with a, with a different eye. And it was a blessing not to come from wrestling because mm. these guys were all thinking in the box, and I was thinking way outside the box. I was like, I'm going to have the Jordans. Uh, oh, that's Wale. Shout out Wale. <laughs> Wale. Shout out the, my brother Ralph Wa- Lauren, man. Wale and Smoke Dizzle were the only two verified accounts tweeting at NXT. When wow. TakeOver was on. And I wore the Ferrari Red Jordans. That's a fact. And when I came out, both of y'all and a few sneaker places, because of you guys, tweeting about it, said, oh, Enzo's got the Rarys on. And they came out on Friday. I had them on on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And it was the first look anybody got on them on, on feet and action especially. And I wouldn't really, I was thinking about it, but I, I didn't, like, I was, I was hoping exactly what would happen would happen. And it did. And I was like, oh, shit. 
I gotta keep virus. this game up. You're a legend, Smoke. Mm-hmm. So a uh, few verified accounts that reached, you know, they have a reach that 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 I uh, I understood, and and the sneaker world has a reach that I understood. And so by the time I'm in the WWE, by the I break my leg. By the way, that's how I got to wear Jordans. I broke my leg in boots. Got a doctor's note that said I could wear Jordans. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like some shit we did in Hall of a School. <laughs> yes. I was like, yo, I got a note from a doctor that says I gotta wear sneakers. Can't wear boots. And I was a shoot. And I was a baller. Like I, I was in cleats, I was in fucking hoop shoes, you know? Like so, man, I felt more comfortable out there than that. So I went out there and I wrestled in uh the Ferraris. Y'all took notice to it. I kept the wave up, spent a lot of dumbass money because I wasn't making much money. Got into my first video game in NXT. That, for me, was life-changing money. Got me out of a, you know, got me a few Jordans. By the time <laughs> I'm on that goddamn main roster, I've invested a few Gs into Jordans, mm-hmm. making a splash on the internet, and not making much money. And uh, by the time I'm on Raw, man, we got our own Jordan. We got a Champ Sports. We got a contract. We got... Mosh making custom sneakers. Shout out Mosh. Uh, we got, you know, sneaker plugs out the wazoo. It was an investment. I mean, craziest, best investment I could have made was into, uh, you know, being a culture vulture. It was just fucking wearing what was hot. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> like, I, you this know, like, crazy, I, yo. I don't, I, you know, yo, like, this brother. Just, uh, you know, who else was doing it? Hey, listen. Nah, I can't, yo. That's my dog. I mean, what man, the could fuck? you, could hey, look, if you could do it better than me, then you do it. Plenty Heard of people you. are motherfucking trying, bro. If you put my shoes on, they would explode. Mm. You fucking nuts. I'll be telling you. I got people. Jordan's one on ones, motherfucker. Play, play your excuses. <laughs> what? Now, where do you get your sense of fashion from, though? Man, it was a lot of marketing uh, behind it, you know, just like putting leopard on everything that I wore just by essence of being from New Jersey, the Jersey Shore, Snooky, all that popularization over the years, mankind being from fucking, you know, uh, Long Island and, 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 you know, just Jimmy Snooker jumping off the fucking, you know, cage in, in Jersey, just the leopard made sense. Just, okay. Now when you see leopard, uh, you know, you're at, you're at Walmart and you see a shower curtain that's leopard and you tweet at me and you're like, Oh, I saw this and I thought of you. It's like, yeah, exactly. You thought mm-hmm. of me. Yeah, mm-hmm. made you think of me, motherfucker. Right. Every time you see Leopard, you will think of me, motherfucker. Uh-huh. Like, that's just marketing, and uh, that was the essence of... And then, you know, bright red and yellow just because of McDonald's and, and, and fucking, you know, the marketeering of knowing that these colors pop gold off, you know, and, uh, you know, the Rari Red Jordans are the perfect example, you know what I mean? And uh, I just think that it was it was, you know, putting the Leopard wig together you know having leopard died in the sides of my head mm-hmm. and not the top because you could make the wig and they have leopard in the wig and, and the kids were wearing it in the crowd and and uh you know the jump man logo with the microphone you know as opposed to you know the ball so you got a cool tony soprano joint over tony there. soprano's That's new you know man. tony he's tony soprano the reason why i have tony tattooed on my arm is because my dad's name is tony so it's not tony soprano that's tony art but yeah here we go. Heard you. Uh, Heard you. So you know, it's just a matter of of the of of thinking outside the box of pro wrestling that I gravitated towards. That when I was a kid, you and I both know, like we 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 shared the same love of wrestling as kids. I loved Macho Man. I loved Jake the Snake Roberts because he had a snake. The toy came with a snake. Mm-hmm. I loved Ultimate Warrior because he had fucking bright neon colors. Mm-hmm. Hulk Hogan was jacked. Had a bandana. Fucking ripped his shirt off. He looked, he, you know, like. These guys were marketing one on one. You know what I mean? Even 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 any greats. Like I'm looking at your toys right now. Like the Dudley Boys putting tie dye. You know, uh, you know, in ECW and you know, uh, you know, just uh, you know, camo and and, and tie dye. Like they you could go, say what marketing. they want about Hogan, but at the beginning, Hogan's message was say your prayers, eat your vitamins. That's what we came up on as kids. So, I mean, fast forward, whatever. I mean, yeah, like... That's real, though. Whatever, but... Yo, it never made sense that they never got McDonald's for Hulk Hogan, huh? That's crazy. That's crazy, and they had the colors. Yeah, that's crazy. It never was was a toy. That toy would have... MJ, right. The wrestling toys and the Happy Meal would have fucking... Bro, that would have... What? That's crazy. Oh, my God. You know what? We just exploded. 
AEW is gonna do something with Burger King. They're gonna have I hope toys they do. in the mother. I hope they do. Watch it happen. I hope they do. You're welcome, would, guys. Yeah, you I heard it here first. <laughs> you heard it here first. I, yo, you guys don't. I'll go get the They Burger follow King. my moves. Okay, they follow my moves. Make no mistake. And I'm not talking about AEW. I'm talking about no. wrestling. The pulse. <laughs> Wrestling. Yo, yo, listen. Would you ever go to AEW? <clears throat> I don't think it's a matter of would I ever go. I think it's, it's more or less a matter go. of would, I, would they ever want me to go there. Mm. Uh, you know, I don't know, man. It's just a matter of, you know, does it does the does does the shoe fit? You know, it's mm. does is the timing right? Are the storylines going to add up? Or is what you got going on going to work with all that I've got going on? Is the schedule going to work? Is 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 it all there? You know and. And, uh, you know, I've yet to have that conversation with anybody. So yeah. uh, I, I'm just getting my wheels turning and wrestling, letting the organic process take place, uh, enjoying my time with the wrestlers that I'm working with. I'm working Juice Robinson, uh, who went to New Japan, quit NXT like a G, said, fuck this. Great you guys tag team. You guys are changing my fucking gimmick. Finn Juice. Um, Went over to New Japan, went to the dojo, worked, uh, you know, Japanese hard style and, and made a name for himself over there. And he's gone over. And uh, I can't wait to work him in, in America here. He's back to America, you know, COVID. And so now we'll see what, what Juice has in store. Uh, he did do Impact Wrestling recently with his uh, partner, David Finley, mm -hmm. son of a uh, great Fit Finley. Mm -hmm. pro wrestler. Finn Juice. So Finn Juice is a thing. And uh, we'll see where that goes, man. I, I get an opportunity to wrestle him on July 9th and July 10th in uh, Belvern in Pennsylvania and Niles, Ohio. So uh, it's out near Pittsburgh. If you're in the area, come check it the fuck out. It's mm -hmm. definitely going to be wrestling. Uh, that's that's what I'm into these days, man. I want to just, I'm, I, you know, man, everybody knows I can rock a mic, all right? I have nothing to fucking prove. So when I come through the fucking curtain these days, I got no mic. I got no music, and I'm walking straight to the fucking. Thing. If you want to hear my music, go on fucking iTunes. <laughs> you know, it, one thing that was going on on social media with it feels a little incomplete, and I hope is it gets completed one day. Was your rivalry with Tama? Like that Tama was Tonga. Yeah, that that was something I wanted to. Tango. Oh, it's still it's still Yo, on. Did I did I start it up? Did the I restart it? Tango. I, <laughs> So, now look now now, 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 now Tama Tonga is, is, is yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now look Tama Tonga is tough you know what I mean? His father is hot. Your cool. father's tough don't make you fucking tough, bro. What the Ooh. fuck are we talking about? Look at Magic Johnson, dude. The I fuck fuck your life, this fuck guy! Here, <laughs> yo! Hey, yo! I've been out here throwing hands at the garden. He's not pussy. I've been out here throwing hands at the garden. You've been riding in the sun, hon. Sitting on the pond. Splinters in your ass crack, dog. Yeah. Pine, speaking, pine. Of, speaking of throwing hands Watch at the, the show, garden. guy. Watch the show. He had a front row ticket. Y'all saw, saw that, him. right? I saw him. MSG, Ring of Honor, New Japan. The invasion. Enzo and Cass jumped the guardrail, doing an invasion in the first ever wrestling show in 60 years by a man not named McMahon at Madison Square Garden. During WrestleMania weekend. WrestleMania weekend. The night before mm -hmm. WrestleMania, what was mm -hmm. the number one trend in the world? Enzo was it March Madness? It, it was, it was, was it the Final Four? It was Enzo and Cass. It was Enzo and Cass. That's what the fuck sure. it was. So, 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 you know what money looks like? They're looking know, at it. It looked like money. So, right, so that, you know what it looks like. That was an invasion, but, you know, even it, it was blurred lines for me, even though, you know, I kind of, you know, kind of knew what was going on, but it still felt, even re-watching the footage, it felt very shootish. Oh, well, it was a work shoot. And, and, and What does that mean in our business? A work is, you know, a wrestling match. Like Hulk Hogan drops a leg drop, pins Andre the Giant, one, two, three, yay! Work. That's a work, right? A uh, shoot is when, you know, Conor McGregor fights, uh, you know, in the fucking MMA fucking octagon. That's a shoot. That's a shoot. real fight. Right, right. So a work shoot is when you're throwing live rounds and you're connecting and you're bloodying each other up, but you're not trying to kill the other guy. You're not trying to kill them. So there's an art to that, too. <laughs> there's an art to that, too. And those guys wasn't, you know, those are some tough those guys. Are, those the are Briscoes, the toughest Bully motherfuckers Ray. out there, bro. You know what I mean? Those you are know, some G -O -D, of the toughest guys. You guys got some work to do. You guys want to scrap with the Briscoes, Enzo, and Cass, guys. You know, you guys yeah, want to scrap with the Briscoes, Enzo, and Cass. They got some work to do, bro. I mean, mm, we did it in the garden. Mm, it never gets any bigger than that. Shout out OG Bubba Ray. Bully Ray. 
Shout out David LaGreca, Sirius Busted Open, Mark Henry, mm. Tommy Dreamer. Those guys uh, got the number one show in all of Sirius Wrestling. Uh, Busted Open, right? So, num- Busted Open is the number one show in Sirius. What does that tell you about the pro wrestling world? It dictates tell, a pulse, people. It, it tells it. It also you tells saw the me, sneakers first on my feet. All right, that yo, was that was guys. That was that was May. That yo, was July. The NBA wasn't you know in July e. August. The the NBA was barely on TV. A-O-E. Guys, you wanted to see the new shoes. You e. turned on wrong. A O E. You know what it also tells me is that when we do our wrestling podcast, <clears throat> that we got a home. We might have a home over there too. Let's go. Might tell me that too. You don't put a saddle on a Mustang. Let him go. Oh, yeah. I love that. Who said I, that shit? He said Don't it. worry about it. No, I know a motherfucker said that, that shit. It wasn't you. It's all you know Yo, I told us. I told this motherfucker that yesterday. So I said, yo, who said it. that, man? Because you ain't say it. Don't worry about no, it. No, 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 no. You know, yo, 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 yo. You want to. No, Brett Favre. was. They said that about Brett Favre. They okay, did, I know they said that. I I, I, listen, I heard Coach fucking Andy Reid when he was the quarterback coach of the Green Bay Packers talking about Brett Favre. Hey, you know, Brett Favre was a gunslinger. He'd just go out in that bitch, throw in toes and touchdowns. He'd just let it go every time. <laughs> he didn't give a fuck. He's like, I got to get this thing out of my hand. Fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Brett Favre was going out there, and they should have highlighted him throwing an interception and getting murdered. <laughs> a fucking helmet. Just, guys all pilled out, has no idea what's going on. Helmet come back in the day, football the was I, a different game. Man. That was my man. Murdered him, murdered him. Got who, murder fucked. Who was your favorite? Yeah, I got the, so listen, it was like Ronnie Lott put his helmet <laughs> under Brett Favre's fucking head, right? Look, leave Brett Favre Murder alone. him, right? Leave Brett Favre him gets up, though. Runs to the sideline, runs to the wrong sideline, right? <laughs> they, they point him in the other direction, like you go to the wrong sideline, you don't even know where he is. Yo, Next yo. play, he gets up and throws a touchdown yo, when he gets put back put out there. Put and then they just cut to Andy Reid, and Andy Reid's like, can't put a saddle on a Mustang. <laughs> that's that's where you got it. <laughs> but that's not where I got it from. Where you got it from? <laughs> Russell Simmons' book again? Nah, the coach said that I was watching um Jordan's documentary, oh. and the coach oh, said that co- the, old coach. The coach said that about Coach Rodman. had the best say. Yeah. They Remember, had, that's where they soft had a coach came from. That about Rodman. That's where soft like this. came from. Remember when a coach would Mustang. say somebody was soft in the ass or they were soft? <laughs> oh, that's that where old came from? ball coach would be like spitting, chewing tobacco. Man, I mean, yeah, soft. one of those. Kids soft. Those yeah. old, people. <laughs> <laughs> old people got the best game. That's a fact. They got the best scenes. Oh, Yo, who was, who was your favorite wrestler growing up? Oh no, he's light in the ass. He's a little light in the ass, a little soft. <laughs> you get plowed over out there. <laughs> fucking God, man. Answer Dude. the fucking question, I, I, asshole. I, 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 before I get to my favorite wrestler back in the day, I had a ball coach one time. I had a ball no, coach no, hit me with this no. one. I had a ball coach hit me with this one one time. There's only two things that smell like fish. What? One of them's fish. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to Oh, yeah, fucker. boy. I don't want to He was talking fucker. about some pussy on the other team, you know? Kid got plowed over. He's rewinding the play. The kid just, kid's getting murdered. <sighs> that was Spitting in a cup. Yeah. So my favorite wrestler as a kid, uh, Jake the Snake Roberts, Macho Man Randy Savage, Shawn Michaels, uh, Stone Cold, and The Rock. You're all of those people in one. I, I, right. So which one of those guys? That Shawn you- Michaels had my heart in when... when you would call like the prime of your youth, like the prime of your youth. When I could fucking figure out the storylines, when I started figuring out what cool was, you know, Sean Stone Cold, King of the Ring, beating Jake. I, as much as I love Jake for the, it was crazy because they both got over. Because Jake was selling his ribs like a motherfucker, and Stone Cold got kicked in the face and got bloodied up. Michael P.S. Hayes smart and stone cold up when he comes back from the hospital. They get the footage of him coming off the ambulance, getting stitched up. They didn't have doctors backstage. He, he, he comes to the ring. Michael P.S. Hayes goes, hey, uh, Austin, before I interview you, Michael Hayes just cut a religious, uh, I mean, uh, stone cold. I mean, Jake the Snake Roberts just cut a religious promo. You might want to think about that when you cut your promo. King of the ring stone the cold goes out there, king of the ring, gets put over because Triple H was getting punished. He was supposed to win it. But this is from said, the, he's fuck, getting punished fuck for the Triple H call. for winning this. Triple H ain't winning this. We're gonna make Stone Cold win it. All right. Well, Stone Cold Steve Austin isn't even a thing. It's stunning Steve Austin. It's the ringmaster. It's million dollar belt. He just got introduced. He's got a bald headed character, black tights, just an ass kicker from Texas. Goes has a match with Jake Roberts after he's stitched up and bloodied, and it's a real quick match. And he gets back and he cuts the promo and he says Austin three sixteen. 
And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold Cold said so. Now, and you want to talk about great promos. In every great promo that there ever was, including my own, I'm a great example. (laughs) The first fucking night you're on the job, you get over your shit. The shit that's going to stay with you forever. And some of it might not have been intentional. Like Austin 316. Was that meant to be? No, the signs are in the crowd that say Austin 316. Mm. Right? They start making those t-shirts. The signs are in the crowd back then because there was no internet. The signs tell the story, you know. And I just heard uh, Austin talk about this recently, but I know it as well as any story I've ever heard in my life, you know. So that's there. Okay, we'll go to the internet era. I'm out there, and I have the whole certified G bona fide stud thing from NXT. All the way into S-A-W-F-T, soft. Now the whole crowd comes with that on my debut. Mm-hmm. They're with that from the fucking mm-hmm. start. But when I was out there speaking on the microphone in between, I said, well, what do we got over here? A couple of haters? <laughs> Next thing I know, there's signs out there that look like mugs that Cup. say a cup of haters, C-U-P-P-A. And I go, holy shit, that was fans that invented that. Fans told me that that, that was, was, that was the shit. They were started. You said couple haters. I said couple in the first promo ever. I said couple. Mm-hmm. But then my brother calls me, and he's in New Jersey, and he has a friend out at him at the mall. And he goes, well, what do we got over here? Couple of haters? Right? <laughs> then it just turns into fucking a couple of haters. Then it turns into the whole crowd. I go, well, what do we got over here? <laughs> a couple of haters? And it's just saying it, and the whole crowd just says it for me. And I don't even, you know, it was a movie. And that's how that shit works. It's like when you want to talk about great promos, it's just something catches in the crowd. You as a wrestler have to be able to recognize what it is that you did. And that's on a nightly basis. And that doesn't go for the promo. That more so goes for the in-ring art. When you're out there throwing shit on the wall in front of crowds, like I have been, without doing it in front of cameras to know what's going to work when you're when you're about to go out and do your thing. You got, you know, I'm sure that uh, Doink the Clown, Gold does, well, maybe, you know, some great acts that you bring in from other companies, they're geared for something. But sometimes you bring a guy in and you go, but you do it at a live event when, when it's protected and there's not many cameras out. Right, it's not right, 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 man. Especially back in the day. That was great. That, what was you about to say, Sean? You just said favorite wrestlers, favorite rap artists. Because you're an artist first. Oh, yeah. Go on, show. Well, it's <clears> funny. <throat> you know, uh, an album that really turned me out was uh, 400 Degrees by Juvenile. Oh, yo, we was mm-hmm. just... That's, mm-hmm. Wasn't we just bumping high yesterday? Yeah, that, yesterday, right? That's I crazy. mean, I, I'm saying it turned me out. I'm saying it turned me out because up until that point, I was listening to Tupac and Biggie and Nas. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Jay-Z was upcoming. Uh, you know, but like, yeah, Tupac's my favorite artist of all time. Rap, hip hop, rock, any genre. I mean, Tupac is my guy. I listen to him more than anyone. As a songwriter, I try to bring the emotions out of people and fucking, you know, things that he did, you know, in my music more than anything. Uh, you know, just the person he was, I loved, I'm fascinated by, so I always loved Pac. Uh, in my older age now, because I had been cultured and got to go to Japan, Ecuador, Chile, China, Peru, you know, everywhere in the UK, and with people who are from all over the world. That's crazy. And you can't just be in a bus blasting Biggie and Pac the whole time and expect Arn Anderson and Ric Flair and fucking Mark Henry and fucking The Godfather to be happy. You know what I'm saying? So you got to be able to mix it up. And luckily for me, my dad was a DJ. So I grew up on Top 40. And my dad did, you know, weddings and, and, and corporate events and and bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and quinceañeras and sweet 16s. And he handed me a microphone. And I was doing the cha-cha slide and the macarena and the Cuban shuffle out there on a mic by the time I was 12, 13. So it was meant for this. You know, I was blessed to do it and have a great dad. Great great guy worked every weekend DJ and worked a full-time job during the week, you know. and uh, So, you know, we weren't rich, we weren't poor, and I sat in the nosebleeds in the garden but i was at the goddamn show mm-hmm. so I, I, I and i got into an art you know that that was applicable so i know a lot of people are blessed with that i learned learned that through my travels learning people knowing them when they leave home and, you know i have great parents but that you know just uh opportunity to travel the world got me 
you know, well versed in music, I find. Because growing up, I would, Dad, you're playing top 40. I mean, the tops, fucking, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, the seasons, the fucking, you know, uh, Gladys Knights and the Pimps and mm, the fucking, mm. you know, so, Ray Charles and, and, and <clears throat> just Michael Jackson, obviously, music that makes people move. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, you know, you, you want to get a dance floor moving. You know what I mean? And being a DJ, you got to be able to get the people up. So you got to know what you're going to play in the pulse. And, you know, I wrote a top 40 hit in the WWE. No, no bullshit. I listened to top 40 my whole life, right? Hmm. So uh, I think that when you, when, you, when you think about music now, for me especially, I'm about to do something that I haven't, uh, you know, broadcasted and haven't released music, but I'm doing rock. You know, I would have never, if you were a kid growing up with me, you would have told me I would have been making rock. I would have told you you were nuts because when I was a kid growing up, I listened to fucking hip hop, mm -hmm. you know, Master P and fucking mm -hmm. Cash Money Records and fucking Juvenile and the Hot Boys and the Lost Boys and Wu Tang Yo, and, you know, all the greats, you know what I mean? And, and uh, Big Daddy Kane and, <laughs> and uh, you know, even Curtis Blow and, and, and fucking all the, all the, all the all the all the greats, yeah, bro. Yeah, too yeah. short even fucking you, you know E forty and you know getting well versed in a lot of different music growing up fucking with different people, but you know mostly what buzzed more than anything in my my area of New Jersey was fifty. Mm. I mean fifty was everything. He yeah, was my dude. childhood. Fifty no, cent. Yeah, and I loved Ja Rule before fifty. That <laughs> and I was made, bro. <laughs> <laughs> God damn, he killed him, man. Yeah, damn. that's why you don't want heat with Enzo. <laughs> <laughs> you a wrestler yo, out here on these streets? Yo, did you? It's ever, like fucking with fifty. It's it, I. Right, so look, this is a, another shoot. Who did you have heat with? Nobody. You know me to be the nicest guy ever. I'm a weed head. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 you know, if you got to remember, if anybody has a problem with me, they're not saying it to my face, man. You know. This is the real world that we live in. Look at it, guys. You see the internet? You, you, you know how many fans probably I meet on lines that hate on my account or talk shit on the internet or tweet at me or had something to say a couple years ago but changed their mind now? Like, give me a fucking break, man. So I, I, don't, I don't dictate, you know, I dictate the pulse. I don't let it dictate, you know, <laughs> what rhythm I'm moving at. You know, I'm, I'm fucking moving at my own speed of my own drum. I'm just fucking trying to fucking, you know, dictate you know like we've what we've talked about you know in the pro wrestling world being able to you know jump over the rails at madison square garden and nobody knew about it that night and how do you do that well the cameras didn't shoot it because hmm. i was in on it and i helped produce the segment with the producer joey mercury joey mercury was on headsets calling the action to the cameraman telling them what to shoot and he's telling them don't shoot this it's not a part of the show the cameramen are finding out on the fly. How do you keep a secret in pro wrestling between three people? you got to kill two of them. We did this. We pulled it off. <laughs> we pulled it off on a Vince McMahon level. We jumped the guardrail because the other two guys that fought us, the Briscoes, were insane and down to make it look real. And by that, it means we got to punch each other in the fucking face hard. So it was wild. We did it. And Bubba came out and, you know, cooled things down. And it was uh, a great... Great way to do it because nobody shot it. So what does that mean when you're in the arena? You're all filming it and putting it out there on the internet anyway. If you're at home... It's just the melee. You're at home. The only way to see it is these videos on the internet. Because it's not on camera. It's not yeah. filmed. So you're thinking that it's not a part of the show. And this is real. And the punches are real. And we're connecting in the face. And you're asking yourself, holy fuck, Enzo bought a ticket to Survivor Series four months ago and showed up at the WWE show. Did he just fucking jump the guardrail with Big Cass? These two are fucking insane. Is this real? And these guys, and this looks real. It's looking like a real fight. So nobody is smartened up to it. The guys who are in the ring don't even know what's happening. They're like, what the fuck is going on? And the cameramen aren't shooting it. Everyone in the crowd is tweeting about it. That's 30,000 people in the Madison Square Garden who are tweeting about this. Of those, many are having videos go viral. Millions of views. We're the number one trend in the world. Because I told them not to shoot it. Don't shoot it. Don't mm. let the cameras from TV pan over to it. Mm. Let the videos that go out there to the world 
have your hashtags and name on it and, and name just being mentioned. It will trend in the world. So it was just genius producing on that level. Uh, you know, it had to be done the way it was done for it to be pulled off the way it was pulled off. Whether people love it or hate it, they'll respect it in years to come. You know what I mean? I'm a real person, too, and I know how to fucking work. You know, and, <laughs> and I went to work that day, you know, uh, on a multitude of levels to make that thing happen. So I think that, you know, to make in, a return to pro wrestling, I would not want it to go that direction again. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was insanity. Uh, but you can only pull it off in Madison Square Garden on a level like that. Now, okay, the next time you want to see Enzo in the garden, it's going to be in a match. Mm. You feel me? I can't wait. <laughs> now, you know, before before we get out of here, this guy got a fucking segment on this show. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with the show and how it works. And if you're not, it's great. So you out there. Well, that, only listen to new music, and I've been listening to Ray Charles and Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald and fucking the Rolling Stones. Me too. Songwriters that when they hit the ground in a private jet, there was no runways with fences, and all the fans flooded in Louisville, Kentucky for the right. first time to get eyes on someone. They lived like rock stars, pro wrestlers, everyone, because the only time you got to see these people was on television or in the flesh. That's so their great. shows were lit. And things were different. Look, and now we got people seeing each other too much. So get on to your set. That's great. Th that, this has nothing to do with music. Or, At all. But, but you that said, was do great, I listen though. to the show? No, no, I no. Said, I'm no, talking I don't about... listen to shit. Oh, this is what Jesus I listen to, Christ. dog. <coughs> <laughs> that's, that's, I'll listen to nobody's I mean, podcast. Oh, my God. How the fuck would I listen to your podcast? Oh, I have my own podcast. Oh, my Jesus. I, I respect oh, it. Oh, But God. he's here. It doesn't matter. Hold yeah, on. You spent, Wait. Time. you spent some time. Hold on, hold on. He spent some. Yeah, my fault. Let me play a little stupid music. Hold Go on. ahead. You got it? Thank you. Buddy. That was perfect, right, Rich? That was perfect. We spent some time in LA, of course. You fuck with porno? Porno? Yes. <laughs> what the fuck? You don't fuck with porn? Remember when you guys used to use your imagination? You on when that type of time? When I was a kid, we used to go into the recycling bin at the goddamn fucking town dump and pull the pornos out of the goddamn fucking... <laughs> Me too. I'm from that time. I'm from you know, that time. I'm from that era. A, you get a magazine, you hide it under a few bricks. Me too. Town. Yeah. I'm from Everybody that Everybody go I'm... in and rip out pages that they liked. I'm from that era also. Okay. All right, you know what I'm saying? But, you know. You ever think about your grandpa never got to see what a, what a, what a, what a white woman and mine never got to see what a black woman looked like? You know what I mean? Like yo, that's, having yo, sex you know with a funny? Chinese lady. You know, having you know sex with funny? a Chinese lady, that's, you know? That's where. Your grandpa never <laughs> saw a Chinese lady and a fucking black lady and a white lady in the same room naked. Now, some of them did. The 70s maybe, was kind of crazy. Maybe, yeah, it was the crazy. 70s in the was 70s, crazy. it was a little spicy. I don't know. It was a little but that, spicy but it was out there. But it wasn't readily available nah, in your it hand. wasn't in the neighborhood. It wasn't, wasn't in, in the neighborhood. Hand. wasn't in your hand. Yeah. You might have got to see it through the glass, big, rub one out. Big Booty One was not created in, nah, like, it wasn't. in, in, it in wasn't. like 1972. That shit probably came like in the 90s. Food All right. We going with Jessa Rhodes, man. We going with Jessa Rhodes. Since my man don't fuck with her, you, you really broke my heart. Really. Jessa Rhodes? Jessa Rhodes. I don't she know has a Jessa very Rhodes. pretty vagina. Oh, yeah? Vagina? Yes. yes. <laughs> Where'd she grow up? Virginia? West Virginia, Mountain Mama. <laughs> Hey, shout out to Jessa Rose. Shout out to Jessa Rose, shout out to, to Jessa Rose for getting excellent. dicked down. <laughs> on camera. West Virginia. <laughs> on HD. HD East camera. Can find her on HD camera. <laughs> HD. Ah, this motherfucker. It's nice. Crazy. Nice one. Yeah, man. That, that oh, was, man. That was, yeah. you, you made Yo, the segment. You are a you, fucking movie. Yeah. Look, brother. Yes. There we go. I, I Come love... to the production studio. Let's do this. Look, no, we're going to get this done. Look, I love Yo. you. Thank Look, you. we can be in Thank this room for... or we can have the whole access to that whole room. Nah, we're going we gonna, we gonna to do that shit over where you at. Important. And I'm going to bring I'm gonna bring the mags, the, the, the fucking um the magazines, the fucking um the toys, the LJN joints, all old joints. I'm going to bring them shits through. But, brother, I love you. Thank you for coming through. Yeah, man. What time is it? You're the definition of a real one. Oh, hey, hey, perfect wait, wait. time. Get the fuck out of look, here. Look, look, motherfucker. It's not... Wait. 
What the fuck? I gotta go back to Jersey. All right, all right, all right, all right. Wait. They don't understand the fuck, game. Fuck, man. Yo, all right, it's too fast. All right, all right, all right. Nah. Look, you can you can make traffic. You can you can make it. Now I usually <laughs> <laughs> stay hydrated. That's the joke, and that's the name of the show. <laughs> stay <laughs> stay hydrated. <laughs> What's that stupid shit you say? Curls for the girls, ways for the babes, naps for the hood rats. Show Broadway, whole personal party. Enzo, I'm all.